So this is a little overview of what we've already done in Tonga. Uh, it's just a reminder, leg one and leg two is where we do a biodiversity surveys. And on three and four, Heather will go and look at more of all the gnarly bits. So we're now at the end of leg one of the Tonga Trench expedition and so far we've managed to map about 35,000 square kilometres of seafloor. So that's huge. That's actually really, really good right now. We're looking at about 50% of that being data that wasn't previously on the world map. In terms of landers, that's what we've done so far. So what we're trying to do is get from 1,000 to 11,000 metres in the straightest line possible and that will mean a lander pretty much every 150 metres of depth. Yeah, so the red ones are from 2019, the blue ones are from this trip. So we have got a little bit more than we had and that makes up a little bit for some of the lost days due to weather. Clear to dive, pumping it. So there was a sub-dive to 6,400. Then there was eight and a half thousand meter dive that uh, Denise did. So we are about five meters above the sea floor now. We're starting to get some sand. There we go, yeah. That's the sea floor. Oh, there we go. Oh, that is a nice starfish. Ooh. <laughs> We found something really quite peculiar at eight and a half thousand meters where there are lots of these tunicates, very peculiar star-shaped tunicates that we rarely see and when we do it's probably no more than one or two in the entire campaign. One of the biggest finds, the biggest head scratches of this entire trip was Denise's dive to eight and a half. And we just kept getting loads and loads and loads of these. We saw one of these on the entire wall of the Zenith Fracture Zone campaign and we saw I think two in the entire Japanese campaign and on that dive there must have been hundreds. It's a type of tunicate, but it's a really, really odd looking tunicate. That's it protecting itself, so it folds itself up. So it's got these really bizarre eight arms and this little, apparently it's some sort of feeding appendage which it leaves out. So quite why they are suddenly so abundant here and so rare elsewhere is a bit of a mystery. So hopefully the, the next leg will maybe enlighten that a little bit. One of the things we've been playing around with on this trip is 3D photogrammetry. So this is now we have uh, systems on the sub that allow us to create our reference scale within a video and then we take the video, we break it apart into frames and then we overlay them and produce what's essentially a 3D mosaic. So we're basically reconstructing the seafloor based on the, on the video from the sub, which is for us is quite a, a new novel thing to be trying, especially when we're doing it at eight and a half thousand meters. Ah, oh, this will be nice for some 3D photogrammetry. So this is a ridge we came along. We came along here and we saw this, and this has all been reconstructed from about 10 minutes of video. In this particular instance, there wasn't much to see, but where we've had other places where you have things like crinoids, it's very difficult to measure the actual density, but once you reconstruct the whole thing, you do, and you can actually measure the height of the ridge based on the path the sub took. And what's interesting about this one, you can retrospectively track the sub, because once you piece it together, it'll tell you where it thinks the camera was. So that was us coming along there and going, ooh, there's a ridge. Let's do a little translate and then go and let's go up it and then went up and over the top of it. I did two dives, one to 10,000 meters and one to 10,800 and we found this really unstable, almost not necessarily featureless, but certainly something that was a big surprise. I don't think I've ever seen such a lifeless place. <laughs> it's incomprehensibly large volumes of sediment just being slowly contorted over time. The 10,000 meter site was one where you'd expect to see lots of tracks and burrows and, and fecal tracks and all that kind of stuff and you expect to see loads of holotherians and we didn't. Probably the only animal, real proper animal we saw were these scale worms and the whole sea floor was, seems to be extremely unstable. Oh, we set off another landslide, look. Yeah, look at it go. Every time we so much as coughed, big chunks of sediment would start flowing away and it would actually accelerate away from the sub. Uh, and it would just keep going like it had a mind of its own. It was like just lots of little avalanches everywhere and the whole so if you look at the colour of the seafloor as well, it's kind of grey colour. So we think that the reason why there's no real huge biodiversity there is because the whole slope is very, very, very unstable. I think the big takeaway from leg one has been how strange the deep part of the trench is. There's not a single thing out the window right now. Like nothing. Absolutely nothing. And that's something that we're now looking into a lot of our acoustic data to see how to best plan the next dive, to work out how to figure out just what's happening there and how to link the deep end to the more normal stuff we're seeing in the upper trench. Absence is as interesting as presence, mm -hmm. just perhaps slightly less immediately gratifying. But it's fascinating why there's absolutely nothing here. I think the 9,000 metre sub-dive is going to be quite enlightening because that's what's going to connect all the crazy stuff we're seeing at the deep end to what 
you would normally expect. I was trying to work out how far up the slope does this phenomenon happen. Surface, weight, release. The horizon deep is desolate is how I would describe it. Desolate is maybe a bit harsh for it. It's, it's, it's like being in a desert at night. I think we're at a stage where we've got enough tantalising insights or unexpected insights into the trench at the end of leg one. By the end of leg two, we'll have completed the whole survey and everything should make a lot more sense by that point. We're only halfway through the biodiversity survey, so I'm confident. The other one I'm quite excited about is actually going shallow. We very rarely go particularly shallow. It'd be almost a nice relief to get down shallower in 4,000 metres and go and see the normal stuff and some, something with a bit of colour. <laughs> Shorter dives, more colour, more species to look at. But ultimately, what we want by the end of leg two is a genuine lander subsurvey from 1,000 to 11,000 metres. That's what we're after, and I think we're still in the game for getting that.